Good day. My name is Brett. This is my channel. And on Thursdays, I'm live talking about DevOps, talking about the life of an IT person. And some days it's fun, some days it's not. Today, it's a little bit of both because I'm going to talk about the iPad, which I have had many of them. And you probably know that I'm an Apple fanboy if you've been around here for a while. And I thought, um, since I've been using it a lot lately, away from my desk. In fact, I've been so lazy that my laptop is essentially a permanent desktop sitting, sitting next to my monitors, and I use my iPad when I'm leaving the room. So one of the big questions I wanted to answer today was in the face of these M1s with the amazing battery, with no fans, and you know, at least in the air, and all this stuff, is the iPad still a contender? Should it, is it necessary for me to even have one, or do I just buy another laptop? And, uh, spoiler, I don't really know the answer to that. I guess it kind of depends. So I want to go through 
all of the stuff that I use on my iPad in terms of my like day job, right? So managing servers, editing code, using all the things GitHub, uh, SSHing around, yeah, all that stuff, remote desktops, stuff like that. And I've done that on this show, but it's been a while. It's definitely before the last major OS update. And of course, we've got this new major update coming for iOS that is going to give iPad even more multi-app features. So we'll be able to manipulate Windows, which is a constant source of frustration for me. I guess I'm getting old because it seems like I can never really figure out exactly the right sw swipes and pinches and touches, even though I use it all day. So if you're new to this channel, if you haven't uh, been here before, just a quick shout out. Let me um, give you some little tips. All right, so if you wanna hear about major stuff, like I just finished up a blog post that we'll talk about in a second, that will hopefully be coming out next month. It's a 3000 word breakdown of what DevOps is, what DevOps isn't, and then I actually give you a evaluation to take for yourself to determine you know, a quick assessment, essentially, of your team and how DevOpsy you are. And I, I made a goal for that, and weeks later, many, many, many hours of editing, and uh, later I have, I have a post. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so in case you're curious, uh, if you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing, what stuff I've launched, things I'm updating, you can go over to patreon.com. The links are below. You can also go up to brettfisher.com at the top and get over there. You do not have to buy me a coffee, but I really appreciate it if you'd like to support this channel, the podcast, and other things. Um, all you have to do to get up to date is just go down here at the bottom click follow. And it's free, and it's low frequency. It's like once a week, maybe, um, of just what, what I'm doing, what's going on in terms of my open source, things I'm creating for free, and maybe some course updates in there. Um, a couple of things we'll be talking about today are code spaces, because that's a big thing, I think, for getting us out of a single machine and into many machines. So we're gonna talk about that. But I have no news to share. There was a couple of things I think announced on the Docker page, but nothing significant enough for me to really um, talk about it at length. So how's everyone doing? Um, hello to everyone out there. Yes, 25,000 subscribers. <laughs> Big news, yeah. Um, my next round number is hopefully 10,000 followers on Twitter. Um, we do have a couple of captains in the room, it looks like. We got Victor over here. What's up, Victor? Another Docker captain making great content. We talk about you all the time on this channel and constantly reference your videos. So keep it up. It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, Paul's, like, Paul's already said, yeah, I'm not too big on the iPad. Uh, went to the M1 instead. So yeah, so I bought my iPad largely so that I could have near all day battery life without burning up my lap and then just the convenience of a couple of pounds of something that has built in connectivity to the internet, which is nice. Um, automatically, I don't have to like tether it to something. I can just, just open up the iPad and go. You know, there's no booting, there's no waking from save. Um, but the M1s have so much of that now. They don't, they don't wake from save. Um, they, essentially, it's instant. Their batteries are all day battery life. Um, thank you. And, you know, if you, the, the one thing that I like about the iPad is it does tend to force me to focus because it's really hard. You can probably get up to three windows if you swipe in and out and you have them, um, if you have two side by side, so you can maybe get three small little windows, but it kind of makes you focus on one window. So I tend to be more productive when I'm in a different room using just that device because I don't have Twitter running and all these things. And I usually have D&D &D on, so I'm not being disturbed. So, but you could do that with a laptop. Like you just, it's just a habit. It's not really the device's ability that causes me to do that. All right, so let's get into it. Um, let's go over to the iPad. All right, so nothing fancy to here. Um, but one of the things you'll notice down at the bottom is I make, by the way, I have the, I can't actually physically show you, but I have the largest iPad Pro with the Magic Keyboard, which makes it more expensive than an M1 MacBook Pro. So yes, another, I'm not so sure it makes a lot of sense anymore. 
uh, kind of approach. So, and I don't have the M1 iPad. This is this is last year's model. This is the this is the non M1, which from what I can see, the M1 doesn't really change anything in an iPad. So, all right. Um, my common apps are down at the bottom. I'm just going to go from the easiest to the most complex. So obviously I've got a full browser in here. If you've got an iPad that's a couple years old and you've updated the latest OS, we now have a almost complete Safari browser um, and more, it's more or less my go-to all day. So I do have the cursor because of the, so you'll see the cursor here because I'm, you can use a, a mouse now, an external keyboard, which I've totally done as well as an external X, Xbox controller for gaming. Um, one thing that I'm going to talk about in a future show is this, by the way, Excel Draw, which is not specific to the iPad, but man, is it an awesome drawing app. I, um, in fact, I will show you what I did yesterday. I stayed up very late last night. Um, all right. So this blog post will come out hopefully next month, but if you, if you can see... I can't really zoom in on that, can I? Um, you can see these are the drawings that you can create with Excaladraw. Excaladraw? <laughs> I've never had to actually say it. Excaladraw. I guess like Excalibur. Uh, anyway, great open source project. Uh, free to use. You can, it saves it locally. It's actually quite, quite fantastic. The whole thing is created in JSON or stored in JSON as the data format. Um, it's all vectors, so you can zoom infinitely, you can save. So um, I've done this DevOps evaluation, which I worked really hard on, to basically allow you a three-step process for evaluating yourself and your team on what I tend to see with all of my clients and customers and all that. So um, check that out when it comes out. And the way you'll know about it is to sign up over at um, brettfisher.com on the Patreon and, or be one of my courses. Cause I'll announce it when all the, in all the courses and all that stuff. So you'll get that stuff there. Um, so yeah, a three parter on, a, you know, hopefully something you can do in less than an hour and ideally in less than 20 minutes. Cause you can probably just look at each question. There's three answers for every question. I'll probably turn into some thing that you can take on the internet in terms of like a type form or something. I'll probably do that, but I'm, I'm, at some point, I would love to make it a part of my courses where you, so you know where you need to focus. And, you know, the dream is someday that I actually have DevOps courses that will help you through a lot of this stuff, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. Um, so Notion is my big thing. So if, if you're not look, realizing what I'm looking at right here, Notion is m my brain. I use it everywhere. So if you just go to notion.so, That is my note-taking app. I still use the Apple note-taking app. I still have Evernote, but 98% of what I do is in Notion and it's fantastic. So you heard me talk about it here often whenever I'm talking about my favorite apps. I highly recommend it. You get a lot of it for free, but I do pay for it. And it's my main company's uh, project management, you know, tracking of everything, <laughs> storing all the knowledge that I gain from, uh, you know, taking notes when I'm in, uh, when I'm learning things, just you name it. It's got, it's got all that stuff in there. So I highly recommend that. I use that a lot on my iPad and iPhone. And next up, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time on VS Code because I think that that's the future of where I'm going to be spending a lot of my time in an iPad. But for the last few years, I've been in Blink Shell. So if you haven't heard of Blink Shell, it is iPad specific. And it's essentially, it's a full screen terminal with what I think is all the necessary bells and whistles on an iPad, you know, native to iOS in the store. You can buy it. You can actually build it and deploy it yourself if you're savvy enough, if you don't want to pay for it, you, it's open source. But the thing I love about it is, come on, zoom in. Okay, let's try a different window. There we go. 
So um, let me move that down so you can see this. There you go. So it's a shell. It's a tiny little mini. Uh, it's um, it's essentially like there's not much in here, right? It's it's just <laughs> it's just the basic shell, and what it does have is all the necessary things to connect everything else. So it has SSH, uh, including command 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 completion as well as history. It has MOSH, which is very important for when you're on the go and you don't want to have to worry about disconnecting and reconnecting SSH because MOSH wraps the SSH client in UDP for sessionless SSH. Uh, it's not perfect because you don't have scroll back, but if you combine it with Tmux and you get super nerdy, you can essentially have a dream set up for remoting into systems and doing everything remotely. If you're a shell person, you have to have this on iPad. If you're someone who Vims or Emacs on a regular basis and that's your thing, and you have a server or Raspberry Pi at home that you want to be on for all of your work, this is my this is your jam. Like this is your number one app. So what I do is you can actually see it automatically lists all the machines that I've stored in its settings. So I have a, a list of servers, including my own Macs, my M1 Mac, remote servers I have on the internet, including a Graviton ARM instance and AWS and things in DigitalOcean. So I have all these and I use SSH keys, which it stores. It'll also create one that I recommend. That's what you do. You create one in here and then you copy that into all the machines you want to get into rather than sharing the same key that you use everywhere else onto the iPad. I recommend you do it the other way. So uh, it allows you to quickly create a key. You can create a key per host, whatever, and you can copy those in through somehow, <laughs> get, get those into the machine, and then you're back here, and I can do something like this, right? I can just do, um, this is into my Ubuntu server in my closet, right? And it has, you know, I have my full ZSH shell there. If I want to jump into some code, um, you know, I have the full space vim, in vim experience. In case you've seen my shows about space vim and in vim, um, that's my jam for being in Vim. So I have that. I can also do it uh, to my Mac. So I can, I, you enable on a Mac, also on Windows nowadays, because it has OpenSSH built into Windows 10. I can, you know, get into that. So this one I have, this particular Mac, or sorry, this particular iPad, I have, I pay for the data connection. So it's a very convenient way for me to get in. Obviously that's not free, um, but I do pay the $10 a month so that I can just turn this thing on, open it up, you know, and it loses, in airplane mode, because I normally stay in airplane mode. Uh, in airplane mode, I lose only a couple of percentages of battery life a day. So when it's turned on. Anyway, so this is me and my Mac, right? So I don't have actually anything in that directory. But the nice thing is, is I can run Docker here. I have all the things that I need. Uh, you know, I run Docker and Kubernetes in the background, except for right now, because I'm live streaming. So I have all that, right? So this is your shell. I can't, uh, I love it. it. You can have multiple ones. You can create many. I can just um, command T to create another one and SSH into a different machine. It'll keep the session open. And, oops. So I can swipe back and forth, right? Pretty convenient. I can put them side by side. It has all those things like you would expect. So. This has been what I've been using for um, a long time. Now, that essentially just turns this iPad into a dumb terminal. I could, I could use a Chromebook. I could use anything else. So it doesn't, it's not great from the point of view of I have to have a remote machine to get into. I have to have solid internet and I have to keep my environment in that machine. So it's better when you can remote in your main machine like I do with my Mac, but it's not, it's not the end all be all. Right. So next up, I, I tried to use full fledged apps and I'm here to tell you that disappointingly, I don't, there's not a single code editor in the, in the app store that I really like. The best one that I have found 
is working copy. So that's this little fingerprint one right here. It's I don't believe it's free. It might have there might be like a free to free to free one with add-ons, but I pay for it because I use it just enough that um, I want them. You know, they should have a few dollars of mine. So the thing I like about this that it's possible to actually get code running on this local machine. It's really janky and I'm not gonna walk through it. There's other YouTube videos, but it doesn't have an internal code server. You can't run Docker on an iPad yet. So uh, what it can do is it can clone my repos. It allows me to do the full Git workflow inside here. And it allows me to edit code. It has code completion on all the, com all the files that I care about. And you know, I can edit, I can commit, I can push it back up. It's got that nice workflow. What I can't do easily out of the box is run it locally, but they do have um, a ton of advanced developer setup stuff where you can actually have this interesting setup where you use a different app. Like there's a Python server app that you can actually get in the app store. And this can, can link to that so that you can technically develop and then you share code through the iOS file system and between these two apps you can you can actually run things in certain specific things like Python. So I don't know if, I don't know how many other languages it supports, probably not very many. Um, the only one I I've, I've ever really seen or done anything with was Python. But that's as bad as good as I can get on this thing. So that's still disappointing, right? Because ultimately I'd love to have the editor and it, the editor's local, and maybe even I'm checking out local, but somehow I'm able to use Docker, the command line here, and you know that actually goes against a remote server. Well, that's when we start to get into a couple of other options. By the way, you'll notice also there's the GitHub app. It's great. I hope one day that code spaces will be built into this. Man, that would be super awesome. Um, but right now, it, it does not as much as you'd hope it would do. So uh, it's not as great as using the browser, but it is really handy when you're on the go and you want to deal with issues or pull requests or you know stuff like that. Um, so I have that. I don't use the top left here. I don't use code editor or prompt anymore. Uh, I think these are both from Transit, the company. They're just too basic, not enough functionality. They're beautiful apps, but, but Mosh are the, um, sorry, the... Um, Blink Shell, I think, is way superior to Prompt. I used to use Prompt three or four years ago. Uh, code Editor, I don't uh, don't use that anymore either. Mostly because it doesn't. I don't think it does a Git clone. It it requires that you have to like FTP or SFTP or something into a server, and I just don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, um, yes, an AWS console, really lame but visually cool. It doesn't easily like i don't think you could even create resources with it but it is a quick way to monitor or check things uh it's a it's more of a almost like a monitoring dashboard or status dashboard to me all right so the things that i want to talk about really are these two down here code spaces and code server and if you've not heard me talk about these i want to freshen your memory all right so on code server I'm sorry. First one, this is the easy button. Get on GitHub code spaces. So if you just go to github.com slash code spaces, um, get in the beta, sign up for the beta. Hopefully they'll let you in. And you can have up to five. The biggest limitation I have with code spaces is that it's scoped to the repo that you created in. So I can't just have one space and, and this is Visual Studio Code we're talking about. So this is a full-fledged web-based Visual Studio Code, which is feature complete in terms of what it can do compared to the one on your desktop. It has everything. It's running, in, in, my, in my world, it has everything. It's running on a server. You can even look at the machine type. It's a four core, eight gig server with 32 gigs of space, uh, disk space, which is crazy. Like that would, to me, if I had to run that all, like if I had to run a cloud server, because I do that sometimes, right? Run a cloud server, store your stuff on it. We'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about code server. That would be significant money for eight gig four core. That would be 20, 30 bucks a month probably um, for a Intel based machine. All right. So what they do 
is they spin these things up in the background as part of your account. And they, if you don't touch them for 30 minutes, they basically go to and like save mode. But it's all image based. In the background, they're spinning up a VM, starting a container, and you can control all of this. So I could do a whole show on code spaces. I'm really getting into them lately. I mentioned them last week. And trying to separate myself from the local disk on any one device as my source of Git truth. Because often I will, you know, what, you know what you do? You Git clone something, you start working on a branch, you're not really ready to commit it up. So you just kind of leave it there with changes that you haven't uh, staged, you haven't committed anything, you haven't pushed it. And then you later, you don't know which device that was. Uh, maybe you got an, a tablet like me, maybe you got a desktop on a laptop, laptop or something. Um, it's, a, it's starting to become a problem for me. And I, I know it's a problem for other people. So ideally, this thing doesn't, you know, it's always in sync. I've tried to sync source code across machines. It's always ugly if I'm not using just Git. If I'm trying to use some other methodology, when it when you have NPM modules and all these other things, it just gets to be very tedious and slow. So I ruled that out. And what this does here is this, see these little ups and downs over here? The cool thing is this, this, this will indicate if I have changed code and not committed or if I've committed it but not pushed it. So I can look at these and essentially these are little servers that I've maybe edited code on. And I presume that eventually, what I'm, I'm hoping they'll have is I can pay more or I can, depending on whether I pay for GitHub or whatever, that I can maybe have bigger servers or servers that stay on longer, or maybe I can have a single server with multiple repos in it, um, stuff like that. But if I just do this, it takes about 30 seconds, maybe, for it to spin up that container of where I last left it. So it's always, it's essentially saving the, the volume that I was editing in. Because again, this is all in, in an image. And because they have a bunch of default tooling, I essentially get what seems like a full Ubuntu instance with Docker, all the tooling that I care. And then I can do whatever I want. I can install stuff. They actually have a whole documentation library on how you can customize this by running your own images and, and what they support for that, as well as using an, your own dot .files repo. So if you have a public dot .files repo in your GitHub, it will automatically load that with shell scripts and other things that you, if you name them with a standard, I think it's like startup.sh, it'll automatically spin all that stuff up. So I haven't got near as custom as I'd like to, but you can already see a couple of things. Down at the bottom, I have a full shell. It is, it looks to me like it's a ZSH shell and it's, it's not the default plain Jane shell, right? Like I've actually got um, a Git add-on here so I can see what branch I'm on. I can see what changes I've made. And I can look at my source code. I can tap on things with my finger. I can use the mouse. So it's a little bit of a superset of what I get with Visual Studio Code on a laptop because I can touch it. I can't touch that on a, on a laptop. And I can leave it. After 30 minutes, it'll go to sleep. And I can pick right back up on another machine in any browser. You'll notice at the top, by the way, that each one, the URL is essentially each one of your VMs. So each one of them have their own custom URL. Now, if you've ever done iPad work, especially development or things where you need keyboard shortcuts, you know about this trick where in order to get full screen in a browser tab and to possibly have, you know, none of the Chrome of the browser itself and then all of the keyboard shortcuts that you, you probably need to work in your app, you go down and you say pin to home screen or add to home screen. Now, when you do that, one, a couple of things happen. Right now, when I'm in this app, one of my problems is, is I, I'm a keyboard person. So, you know, if I command shift and left or right bracket, I'm alternating tabs in my browser. I don't want to do that. I wanted to actually do that in the files of my, my editor, which are these tabs right up here. So in order to do that, I need to say this to the home screen. However, the, it, it's, when you do this, it's fixed to the URL or at least the website that you're on. So this means that for each one of these code spaces, the five that I have, I would have to create a separate home button. And then when you do that, the home button requires that you reauthenticate everything. And if you've ever dealt with code spaces, there is a little bit of setup. So you can see that it's, it's refreshing now and it's realizing that I've 
been gone a while, so it's it's going to do some things. It will require me often to log in three or four times to get my VS Code all set up because one of the things it can do is will sync settings with all your other VS Code editors. So you have to enable that, then you have to log in, then you have to enable pull request features and log in and enable GitHub. Um, I use some GitHub add- add-ons and it, it just, each one of them requires a separate login and you're going through this process. So you definitely need a password saver in order to, to use this. But here, here I am, full screen in an editor. If I open up two files and I command shift and brackets, I now am switching editors. I'm trying to think if I, can I zoom? Yeah, it's not letting me pinch and zoom, which because it's expecting to be a desktop app, it doesn't let me to pinch and zoom. So that's unfortunate. I wish I kind of had some of the just nature of bl- like Blink, that's the SSH shell. It does, it supports all that swiping, pinch and zoom. It does all that. But because this is usually a desktop app, you get some of that funkiness where it doesn't recognize gestures or there's no, you know, it expects there to be a hover, but you may not be able to hover with your finger. So there's no pop up. But once you, well, now that we have mouse support, at least I can hover over things and I can do things like go into my source control and go into branches and hover over the button to know what the heck that little button down there is. Like that, that's some of the nuance. And of course, it's not popping up for me. Oh, maybe I got to be in there. Waiting for the pop ups. Nope. Yeah. So it's not even. It's not even giving me this pop-ups. I seem to remember that does work in the browser. So maybe this is a full screen bug. Anyway, it's not perfect. But I still have my shell. It it saves everything. I right back where I left off when I'm done. It's great. So it's to me as close as I can get to having Docker available in some fashion, saving what I've done so that it's not available on another machine. It does require that I always have internet. There's none of it that's going to work locally without internet. So you can't really do it in the mountains <laughs> or wherever, in the middle of the ocean, whatever. Um, so that's not a huge issue for me, but it is a concern uh, when I'm traveling. All right, let me, uh, let me get, check on the questions. If anybody have any questions so far, because I've got a few other things I want to talk about on this iPad. Yeah, Anton, um, one of the things that I do, uh, you know, about not having internet with Notion is before I get on the plane or uh, going into a place that I may not have Notion, I click on all, it does have offline mode, but it doesn't cache all the pages like Evernote might or Apple Notes might. So, but what it will do, and you probably know this, um, is that it will cache recently used pages. So I tend to go through my top 10, like the things that I know I'm going to work on, and I just click on all the t- pages. It's kind of tedious, but I spend a couple of minutes right before I leave doing that, and then it's cached them all. Then I can still edit them offline, and then we'll resync when I come back to an internet connection later. Um, it's not ideal, because part of the problem is you don't know which ones are truly cached. There's no cache indicator. But yeah, um, I imagine that they'll get there eventually. Um, so... Does CodeSpaces support VS Code extensions? Absolutely. Um, it supports all of them. So, for example, so I'm, I'm using the mouse a lot so you can kind of see where I'm clicking, but I'm just tapping on things sometimes. So over in my extensions, my extensions are all the ones that I set up on my local Mac. So one of the things you do is you turn sync. Okay, that's, I know it's kind of small, isn't it? Um, Sync settings is on down here in the bottom left. So just like in VS Code on your machine, you log into GitHub or Microsoft, you sync the settings with that editor. Whenever you use code spaces, it, this will be off by default when it creates a new code space. This is a part of the annoying setup of each code space. Um, I, I would not set up new code spaces very often if they let me ma- you know, manipulate multiple repos easily. But it's kind of designed for like one code space per repo right now. And I obviously have more than five repos I deal with on 
on a weekly basis. So I'm constantly deleting and recreating co code spaces, which is annoying because the whole setup and authentication process takes you a few minutes. So anyway, yes, all the extensions that I've tried work, except for maybe the Vim extension. Um, because I like Vim keys, I prefer those when I'm editing to manipulate the text and they don't seem to always work or work at all. So I kind of just have to get over it. However, I get touch. So maybe not a huge deal because I can manipulate things with the with three different ways while I'm on, when I'm in the editor. But yes, absolutely, extensions are totally a thing. You can see that I have like the GitHub pull request extension here. I have uh, enhanced source control through the GitLens. I'm a, I'm a big fan of GitLens. So if you add the GitLens extension, you get all this additional stuff in your source control, including uh, branches and commits remote man you know managing your remotes and all that stuff that's all a part of the the git lens extension and then github actions if i'm in you can see that i'm in a repo that has github actions so i can i can look at the results of them i can look at the status without going to a web page and testing them so yeah like i said it's even got docker compose in here by the way so the old docker compose is here not the new one yet um yeah, Docker, the new Docker Compose is not yet available. So that's one of the things that I would customize on my machine is I would probably have a, a dot .files that would go out and pull down the Docker Compose plugin for the new Docker Compose CLI because I really like it. Um, anyway, so I can build images here. I can push them here. You know, I can log into Docker Hub. All that's available in Codespaces. Yeah, Mike is like, yeah, Mike is saying Codespaces is, uh, seems like AWS Cloud9. It's very much that. Um, it's a, it's, I think the fact that so many of us are using v VS Code, Cloud9 to me was just a different, you know, I don't always want to use web editors. And I love this idea with VS Code that we started with a desktop editor and now we're getting all these different various web editors. And, and I think I did answer Mike's question about, yes, Docker, Docker Compose. Uh, Kubernetes is not installed, but I could, install it. Technically, this is all running in a container, so I could use Kind. I could probably set that up. I haven't tried it, but as long as it can fit in the 8 gig of the image I'm, you know, the container I'm running in, I can probably do it. Now, for even beefier setup or more custom, if you want to go beyond this and you want just a single server, what you want is code server. Um, and that is this. Right, go to coder.com. They have they're they're known for their open source project. I've talked about them before, but uh, Code Server is their major open source project that gives you VS Code in a browser that you run yourself, and then if it's on a machine that presumably you control, then you can store you everything there. You can store all your repos. You can store all your keys. You know you you can trust it more. You can, have, you can add whatever resources you need to the, the thing. And it can run in a container or on a host OS. Uh, and it's great. You, you, but you've got your own concerns now. Now you have to worry about getting access to that machine remotely and securely. You have to worry about TLS certificates, all that stuff. They've, done, they've got a new feature recently in the open source version. So see, this is, this is full-fledged VS Code, right? This isn't some almost like VS Code, which there are a couple of ones out there that are like that. They're kind of like VS Code and they support VS Code extensions, but this is truly VS Code. So uh, one of the things they now do is they will automatically give you a cdr.co URL that has SSL. So they essentially proxy your server with this new code server link option, which is really neat. Um, not sure... I haven't done it yet because I need to kind of understand the security of it before I do this. Because if I'm doing this, it's probably going to have a lot of permissions to a lot of things that I want to maintain. So I want to make sure that I'm encrypting everything, that authentication is at all levels. And it, and it does that really well, but I'm not quite there with full-on trust. I don't, there's thousands of people using this thing, but I still want to understand it better before I completely use them as a proxy for all my traffic <laughs> to my uh, local machine. So code, their website will allow you, basically they will host it for you if you don't want to go through all the labor. So, 
And because it's VS Code, it'll sync settings. It'll do all the things that I care about. And it's kind of like, if you don't want to wait on code spaces to add all this functionality, this is what you want. I run this now on, let's see, on a server. Is it showing that? Yeah. So I have it running on a Linux machine in my closet and I can just jump into that with a browser. Yeah, Victor's saying K, K3D should work, yeah. Linux server has a better one. Um, well, so I run this as a container. So the coder, codercom, code server image is this, and they have great documentation on it. So I haven't, um, Linux server makes some great stuff. Um, I know what you're talking about, but, um, hey, thank you, Francisco. Thanks a lot for the super chat. Uh, by the way, newest Docker captain, welcome. Welcome to the club. Thanks for the super chat there. I appreciate that. Um, and if you didn't see me mention in this channel, by the way, uh, Francisco's got a great video of DockerCon that he posted that's essentially 20 minutes of cramming you through some of the best of the entire conference in 20 minutes. It was, it's a really great video. Um, uh, if you just look on this channel or in my Twitter from yesterday or the day before, I mentioned it as well as his. Um, yeah, congrats. So, so I do the coder thing, right? So if I go back to my, um, let's see, you got iPad, got too many screens here. And I go to code server. I was actually having a problem opening it up. while ago because I had killed it on the server <laughs> and I didn't have it running and I've been using code spaces so I haven't been using this as much as I used to um, but this is this is kind of like a lot of the other web browser based self-hosted editors this is the full featured thing right there are also other things that I've done this one's just not working, but it, it looks just like code spaces when you run it and it ha and you want it to be its own app on your, you know, iPad, you want, you want to put it to the, to the home screen. The other thing that is not free, but, and I'm not going to run it cause it's totally going to mess up my streaming software, but this parallels access, I, I just love parallels. It, it's the only thing that really works on the M ones now. Um, I've paid for it for many, many years. I run Windows machines in it. I run Linux machines in it. I run Mac inside Mac with it. It just, it does all sorts of stuff. It's great. I'm a big fan. I've used all the other ones, but I always come back to Parallels. It even has a plugin for all the local tools that you might use for VM at the command line. So like Docker Machine had a plugin back in the day. Um, Multipass, I think all the other things uh, mini cube, I think has a plugin so that you can use parallels as your VM backend. Anyway, one of the things that it does is it has this parallels access, which you get, which gives you remote access to a machine like a Mac or windows machine. But the cool thing that it does for Mac is that it, it allows you to go like kind of full screen with your app. And so it, it, it basically changes the display of the machine so that you can have full screen Mac apps or Windows apps and have that iPad like experience. And it's really great actually, if you have a solid connection to the machine and your machine is on and you can get to it, which is not always possible, um, Parallels Access is still a great backup plan. I mean, I just leave my laptop running, I go upstairs and I Parallels into it from here, I go full screen in VS Code and I have everything, right? And then I can full screen into you know the other apps on my Mac. So it it's pretty great. The biggest problem with it is that because those aren't native iPad apps, they're not touch like it tries to handle the touch thing, but it's you'll usually screw up stuff if you try to start touching the screen because you're technically tapping with the mouse and it you know it's hard to drag, it's hard to pinch and zoom. So it's it's not perfect, but man, it's super good. I highly recommend it. Um I pay them you know, or my business pays them the, whatever it is, eight, 70 bucks a year to keep a license of it. Um, of the whole parallel suite, they have a whole suite of tools that you get. Anyway, 
I love that. Um, I use jump host a lot. This, that's this one here. I use jump a ton to get into Windows machines, as well as it can also VNC in to other machines as well. It's very, <laughs> I think it's very feature complete and you get a lot for whatever the small price is. I think it's, I don't know, $4 or $8 or something. <clears throat> so I very much use that. Um, and then, yeah, I have VPN clients, other boring things. So I'm not sure we care about all that. Um, what else? I think that's really it when it comes to specifically DevOps stuff. Unless anyone has questions. Yeah, I don't think I really have anything else. Um, any questions? The Linux server. So I'm going to look that up while we're here. Um, so that's Linux server. Uh, yeah, and there's... Is it the Cloud9 one? Is that what we're talking about? Docker code server. Did I miss it? I got a lot of, they've, they've got so, so many repos. Um, no, I'm just going to search for it. Hmm. Not finding that, Sabin. Oh boy, that didn't help. Docker Hub search. You're not the best. Mm, code server. There we go. So you like this one more, huh? I'm about to check this one out. Yeah, so that looks like VS Code. Yep. Yeah, one of the things that I'm interested in is maybe doing this on a really cheap ARM instance, like on Graviton and having my own accessible from everywhere, not just something in my closet that my home IP might change or my power at home goes down or the server goes down. Um, of course, if I did that, I'd probably be running on random ports and do all the things to make sure that it's not at risk. Um, but yeah, that looks good. I'll check this one out. I'll try it. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. I've been trying to get mine set up with its own built-in uh I think I don't think I actually have the code up there, but um its own traffic front end proxy to go get me a less encrypt certificate and automatically set all that up, but I haven't really got all that working yet. Um and I'm just I'm paranoid about using them as a proxy in the front of it. And I yeah, I was also concerned about performance of having to route my connection through someone else's server. Yeah, for v, uh, VPN zero tier. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard about a couple of the VPNs, but I, I have a two things that I use for VPN. I just run an open VPN container on a server that of my own, and then you know I I don't need need to hop all over the world and you know choose regions. I don't really do that. But the other thing I I'm lucky to have is I have um, I'm a big fan of Ubiquity network gear, and the Ubiquity amplifies have a built-in VPN as well as a client. So um, from any of my mobile devices, I can just run their app, click connect, and it'll automatically connect to my home. 
and then I'm routing everything through my home as well as getting access to all my home servers. That's a, a built-in feature of Ubiquity. So I use that mostly. So I don't have a lot of experience with the third-party VPNs. All right, so I think, so here's the thing. Um, I feel like I'm not sure. I'm, I have the iPad, so I use it. But now that we have M1, and I can buy an all-day battery, fanless, full-fledged Mac for less money, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not sure I would do this again. I do love the touch and the pen. I have the pen and I do use creative things. I draw diagrams like I have a bunch of, <laughs> I have a bunch of crappy diagrams that I try on my iPad, right? I do stuff like this. You know, where I'm trying different diagrams, I, I make things that I never end up putting on the internet because it's garbage. So um, I'm trying my hand at that and other stuff that makes sense, but I wouldn't, so I wouldn't get that on an, a laptop, but I'm not sure that's worth all the money. I use it for a lot of other things, watching videos and reading, and it is my, it is my go-to book reader and stuff like that. But yeah, for development... I don't know, man. The M1's kind of, M1 laptop's kind of the thing I think that we're all going to be used to. So anyway, I don't know what you think, but if, I, if someone asked me right now, I would probably recommend not going iPad simply just because it's almost a hobbyist device, I feel like. I am definitely not naturally more efficient at DevOps day-to-day -day on an iPad. I think the only thing it really does for me is because it's limited and because I'm usually full screen on an app, you know, having code spaces up and then having the browser up so that, um, by the way, code spaces, if you, you can launch ports and it'll spin up ports so that you can see things remotely. So that totally works and it automatically works out of the box. So if I sat here in this machine and I, in the command line said, do I have a duck? Oh. See, now it's, now I've lost keyboard. I might have to refresh. Oh, there it goes. And this is part of the problem is because it's a desktop app, uh, if it's a multi-window, um, I don't, so I don't have access to the menu necessarily unless I come up here and then I, I wanted a terminal, but the keyboard shortcuts don't always work unless I'm in full, full screen mode. So now I'm down here. I've got got some weird issues with it's not spacebar is not working. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put the spacebar in that way. So if I do that, so if I Docker Compose up in code spaces, it will automatically open the ports and then I can access it remotely on a browser tab. But this starts to get kind of janky. It, it starts to, um, it's just not ideal. I don't know. There's a lot of little rough edges, thing, like you just saw, things freeze up. Things, uh, my, if I alt tab or command tab from one window to another, it doesn't always properly go back to where the cursor was. There's just lots of stuff that over the course of an eight hour day could really hang you up. So um, anyway, <laughs> Paul's like, this is pretty much all the steps I went through. <laughs> yeah. The big one for me was the M1 gives you the freedom from a permanent internet connection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, nothing, nothing beats local. Right. Um, now what I really like is the code spaces, you know, the drop down now in GitHub will let you just open it up in VS Code and then it uses VS Code remote code spaces with the full fledged app on your desktop. So if you didn't want to have to get clone things down, which now that I'm managing so many different repos across my open source, it, it, I don't always have the latest. So then I have to, you know, do, I have to find out where I put it. I have to pull, I have to do all those things, right? So code spaces actually become simpler for me because I'm already in the website and I can just click a button and it I'll, delivers it there. But if you're in, if you've noticed in GitHub now, if 
if I just go uh, to like this one, the code option lets me open code spaces. Uh, where'd it go? Oh, you know what? This may not work in Firefox. So there would be an option here in my other browsers, that's interesting, that allows me to open it with code spaces on my local machine. And I'm not sure why that's not there. Let me check on Safari. So you've probably seen that. But I, I've started to do that, that a lot because now I'm using the remote machine. Um, hmm. I'm not seeing on that either. Not sure why. That's weird. Yeah. For some reason, that button's gone for me. I don't know why. Anyway. All right. Well, I think if we got, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to wrap this up for today. I give it a solid meh. Um, still a fun little device to have, but yeah, I'm thinking M1. Um, all right. Well, tell me what you think in the, in the comments or give me a thumbs up or something. If you like this video and you want to see more, um, and if you're in the United States, happy 4th of July weekend. That's why I got the colors back there. Uh, we got 4th of July coming up, and it'll be a nice long weekend here. And I'll see you all next week here on YouTube Live, same time on Thursdays. Ciao.